Hey everybody, this is lecture 12.1. Uh, we're going to be talking about white collar crime. Uh, so the first thing we talk about is a general definition of white collar crime. Then we'll talk about the types of white collar crime. Those are generally broken into corporate, devi corporate uh, crime, occupational crime, and governmental crime. So uh, Sutherland first uh, studied white collar crime in the 1940s. Uh, C. Wright Mills also did a fair amount of uh, study of white collar crime. Uh, and it's important to remember that this class of crime, this well this class, the white collar class, right, the office workers, those type of people, they weren't really present in society, at least American society, until about the 1940s. So this was a, um, a new type of people almost. Uh, at least uh, a lot of white collar people. And uh, Sutherland's first studies focused on occupational crime. So occupational crime is a specific type of white collar crime that occur that is committed by upper and white collar class people, which is composed of respectable or at least respected business and professional men. Keep in mind, women weren't really in the workforce in the 1940s, so he used the word men a lot in that regard, but obviously it can be applied uh, to women as well. So, uh, just to reiterate in case this isn't utterly clear, white collar crime is that crime that happens effectively uh, in business. And then occupational crime is crime that is committed uh, when people do it as part of the job. White collar crime has three categories. Uh, that occupational deviance, then we have corporate deviance, and governmental deviance. Uh, there are three general reasons why some people are more likely, more likely than others to be deviant. Uh, first of all, some people have a stronger criminal motivation, uh, so therefore people are greedier than they are afraid of being caught. The second is greater criminal opportunity. So you have more of a chance of being a criminal, so you might be more likely to be a criminal. So if you know nobody's watching you, but you sit in a room with a big pile of money every day, uh, you might be more tempted than other people would be to take some of that money. And then weaker social control. So there isn't law enforcement. If there are no police, some people uh, may be more likely to break the law than others. And these are three reasons why anyone could be deviant. And within the world of white collar crime, these same things apply. So uh, these are three reasons why someone might rob a bank. These are also three reasons why someone might steal money from their employer. But there are certain things that make white collar uh, deviance and white collar crime unique. Uh, first is the use of power, influence, or respectability to minimize detection. The white collar criminal uses the appearance of being an upstanding individual to, um, to hide what they're doing. And I am sorry, I'm recording in a different room. If you hear like some weird beeping and clicking, that's because it's my parrot. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, second is rational execution to maximize profits. The white collar criminal is more able to control the ways that uh, the crime goes down, right? They have more control over the situation. So somebody who works for a bank and decides to steal money via embezzling it has more control over the situation than someone who, say, robs a bank and goes in there with a gun and tries to get as much money as they can at one time. Uh, the third thing that makes white-collar deviance unique is a non-criminal self-image. The white-collar criminal often does not think of themselves as being a criminal. Uh, they think, well, I, you know, I've been wronged by this company, so I need to take some money. I'm not a criminal, though. And that there is a certain advantage to that. Uh, the, vi the victim's unwitting cooperation. So, uh, in white-collar crime, those who are uh, victims of white-collar crime often go along with it. They might sign a form because someone tells them to sign a form, but when that form is signed, it results in a lot of money being stolen from them. Uh, that is the nature of white-collar crime. 
And then the, the biggest thing, quite frankly, is that society is relatively indifferent to white collar crime. Uh, white collar crime is something we just kind of go along with uh, because it is perceived as being less dangerous than blue collar crime. So that's generally an overview of white collar crime. Now let's talk specifically about the types of white collar crime. First, corporate deviance. Corporate deviance is carried out for the benefit of a company or an individual, namely uh, one of the leaders of that company. Uh, there are four major types of corporate deviance. Uh, there is deviance against employees, so that would be uh, underpaying people or uh, not paying health insurance when they ne need to. There's deviance against customers, so this would be something like price gouging, so charging people too much uh, for the product uh, and getting away with that. There's deviance against the government. This probably takes the form most frequently of not paying taxes. Uh, it might take the form of not following uh, regulations. And along to go with that is deviance against the environment. This is like polluting a river and going against regulations and that sort of thing. In 2002 alone, and keep in mind that is uh, relatively dated. In 2002 alone, corporate criminals were responsible for devaluing their companies by $53 billion and costing about 162,000 jobs. Uh, so and that, those are corporate crimes, right? So when you devalue a company, you pay less in taxes. Uh, when you pay less in taxes, you help, uh, you harm the economy, you harm uh, the government, uh, when you uh, do those things, it often costs people employment. When you cost people employment, you take away their income, uh, people get sick, people don't have health insurance, people die. These are real consequences. Uh, some of the more famous uh, people who committed acts of uh, corporate deviance were Kenneth Lay and the Enron uh, scandal, uh, where they effectively uh, stole a whole bunch of money and then drove the company out of business and then ran away. Uh, Arthur Anderson and Adelphia, the similar kind of situation. Uh, Martha Stewart, uh, uh, you know, fashion and um, home decor icon Martha Stewart, that Martha Stewart. Uh, she uh, had insider information on a stock that was about to be sold and bought and she acted on that insider information. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but that's called insider trading. Uh, insider trading is against the law because if it happens in mass, then that effectively will cause the stock market to crash. And then uh, Bertie Madoff's massive Ponzi scheme that occurred in the mid 1990s, uh, he took um, massive amounts of money from people's retirement account. He uh, paid off some of those people so it looked like it was an actual investment but then when time came to cut and run most people lost their money. Um, Ponzi schemes are one of the more common types of uh, corporate deviants. Uh, corporate deviants are typically illegal um, so here are some examples of corporate deviants so more moving corporate headquarters to avoid taxes so uh, if a company, there are a lot of companies that are based in Delaware specifically, even if they don't actually have uh, headquarters in Delaware, they pay their taxes in Delaware because Delaware has a very, let's say, forgiving tax laws, as in not very many tax laws. Uh, the Cayman Islands, uh, it's a territory very close to the United States. People often move their corporations there. And when we say move a corporation, it's like basically a P.O. box. And those things aren't inherently against the law in many cases. So they're not necessarily illegal, but they are deviants, right? So they hurt society. They're not something we like pe people to do, but in many cases, they're not against the law. Overpaying executives is another form of uh, corporate deviance. Uh, so uh, the average... Um, executive, the average CEO can make anywhere from 350 times to 500 times the average worker. Uh, that is, uh, while a common practice, also 
uh, somewhat deviant because we don't necessarily believe that the person in charge should make not $500 more, but 500 times as much money as the average worker. Uh, stacking a board of directors uh, toward the end of going along with a central CEO or figure that way, uh, thus um, taking away the semi-democratic nature of corporations, and giving money to candidates of both parties to ensure government favor and tax breaks. For example, oil companies often make massive donations to both the Democratic and Republican parties, as do tobacco companies, as do computer companies, as do almost every type of major corporation. All of these things listed on here are practices that are not inherently illegal. And actually, if I remember correctly, this heading should probably say typically legal practices. Um, but they are things that are deviant while not necessarily illegal. Now let's talk about occupational deviance. This, this is what we talk about more, most frequently when we talk about white collar crime. We talk about those things that people do as part of their job. Uh, white collar crime committed by employees for individual gain is less costly than that committed by corporations. So when people do these things, it typically hurts society less. Uh, but it is still dramatically more costly than street crime, right? So when somebody uh, mugs another person and takes their, their wallet, that uh, is scary, but it only really steals about $100. Uh, when somebody embezzles a million dollars from a bank, that is more harmful to society than the 50 bucks, but less harmful than if a major corporation uh, causes, uh, say, doesn't pay its taxes for 15 years and costs society a couple billion dollars. Um, and these are, you know, grades of damage that are done to society. It's estimated that as many as 60% of American employees may steal from their employers if the opportunity is presented. Uh, and this ranges everything from um, yeah, it could be, it could hypothetically be stealing a stapler, right? A lot of people do those kinds of things. Uh, but more we're talking about, uh, taking money, embezzling money, if the opportunity is present. And that is the definition. Embezzling is the stealing of money, and it costs, um, the economy as much as 200, uh, sorry, 27.2 billion dollars per year. That's, that's nuts. Uh, commercial banks lose five times as much to embezzlers as they do to armed bank robbers. That not that something? Isn't that a, a big deal? So that means that there are not only way more uh, embezzlers than there are bank robbers, but it means they're getting away with a lot, lot more. The average bank robber only gets away with about $5,000, right? The average embezzler gets away with at least $100,000. Um, financial fraud is also very prevalent. This includes tax evasions, so uh, not paying your taxes. Incur includes uh, security fraud, usually in the form of not paying um, for uh, elements of those various securities. There are also deviants within specific professions. So these would be acts committed over the course of an individual's occupation, and it is sometimes uh, expected of the person in their job, right? So it may be that an accountant is expected by their boss to uh, cook the books, to uh, not necessarily pay the taxes of the boss quite right. That would also qualify as deviance within professions. Uh, within specific professions, um, medical misconduct occurs in, um, among doctors, right? So fee splitting, so, uh, charging too much for a given, um, operation and basically taking some off the top, uh, unnecessary, unnecessary surgery, uh, so especially within the realm of plastic surgery, convincing somebody that they need a procedure without them actually needing it. Uh, and fraudulent payment claims, and that can take any variety 
of forms. Uh, lawyerly lawlessness. I think that was just put in for alliteration. This is overcharging and intentionally causing delays in the court. Uh, some of those would be more legal actions than others. Uh, there are some lawyer tactics that would involve, uh, you know, delay tactics. Uh, those are deviant, if not absolute, if not illegal. Uh, accounting abuses. So, like I just mentioned, uh, sometimes accountants help their clients uh, break the law. Sometimes a, uh, accountants break the law on their own. And it sounds like my baby's acting up too, in addition to my parrot. Uh, this is just the lecture of interesting sounds. Let's finally talk about governmental deviance. Uh, there are many public officials that abuse their power in a variety of ways. So officials will abuse their power by um, when politicians run for office, right? So there are certain uh, uh, certain um, roles in the government that it is highly unethical for that government em employee to also uh, back up, back um, a political candidate. Political corruption uh, and the abuse of power for personal gain. Uh, there are quite a number of politicians in our world today that are guilty of abusing their power, of holding meetings at their properties, and uh, thus if they hold meetings at their hotels and their properties, uh, they are uh, capable of not only having their political meeting, but making personal money off that meeting itself. That qualifies as political corruption. Election improprieties and the use of illegal or unethical means to win elections. This is a form of governmental deviance. And occupational violence against citizens. These all have a very long history, uh, not just within our government, but all governments. There are many ambiguous laws within the way government should work, and because of that, there is often a lack of information and responsibility on how uh, governmental deviance occurs. Because you know the governments are governments are the ones that make the laws, right? And if government functions because of a unjust uh, loophole, then uh, that may result in um, some pretty bad stuff. Let's briefly talk about uh, the global perspective and official corruption. White collar crime is is very common around the world. It's not just in the United States. And official corruption is very common around the world. We are actually relatively stable in this regard in the United States. We don't really have so much of this. There are some countries, especially more struggling countries, where to get a passport filed or to get uh, something done by a government official, it is necessary to actually bribe that official. And that's a common part of being an official in some countries is taking bribes. Um, that luckily doesn't happen uh, as much in the United States because we do have some degree of governmental accountability. And it's not just the United States, um, you know, Great Britain, France, uh, more developed countries, these are, these are countries that also have that under control. But there are some places uh, that are very poor, that have very large populations, that have major problems with their democracy. Those places have a greater um, degree of uh, governmental corruption, um, which is a major problem in those societies. Um, okay, that's it for this lecture. Uh, again, sorry for the weird sound effects. Um, if you have any questions in anything, please let me know, and I will talk to you soon.